Master Chief misses the jump and falls to his death before being vaporized by the 100 million degree heat of the Pillar of Autumn exploding. What the hell happens now? Well, today we're going into extreme detail to analyze the butterfly effect that Master Chief dying would have had on the rest of the Halo story. So, what would have happened if Master Chief died at the end of Halo 1? Well, it's time to find out. But before we do, a very brief word from today's sponsor, Payday 3 and their brand new story DLC, Syntax Error. Set after the game's ending, the gang are forced out of retirement after their bank accounts are drained and a mysterious faction tries to eliminate them. Following a trail of rare quantum technology leads them into their highest tech heist yet, stealing a military-grade drone operating system while evading the gaze of an advanced AI. Syntax Error brings a new heist, cutscene, suits, masks, weapons, and more. So head on over to paydaythegame.com slash payday3, or hit the link in the description to play now. So immediately upon Chief's death, this timeline is then hit with another major conundrum. You know, Master Chief wasn't the only one in the armor. Cortana was as well, and there is no way that her chip is going to survive a 100 million degree explosion. So, in one failed daredevil stunt, both of humanity's greatest assets perish. With both Chief and Cortana dead, that of course means that dust in echoes never happens. The longsword never takes off from the autumn and the two main survivors of Alpha Halo never make it to orbit. Now, this is significant for a whole load of reasons, but one of the primary ones being the events of the first strike. This stuff is your history. It should remind you grunts what we're fighting to protect. First Strike begins right as Combat Evolved ends. It ties together the story of the survivors of both Alpha Halo and also the Fall of Reach, of whom are still stranded on Reach, and it contains one of the most important missions that the Master Chief ever carries out, Operation First Strike. But of course, Chief ain't around anymore, so the events of the First Strike are gonna go down rather differently. Firstly, Linda058, who was Blue Team's sniper and one of Chief's closest compadres, is basically just going to vanish from the timeline. She was gravely injured fighting on Reach and left the planet in cryo right next to Chief on the Autumn in hopes that the ship could make it to safety and she could be saved. But of course, the Autumn didn't make it to safety. So when Keys took the ship down to Alpha Halo, he jettisoned Linda's cryo tube out into space so the Covenant couldn't get their hands on her Mjolnir, among many other reasons. For the entirety of Halo 1, Linda's just kind of floating in the orbit of Alpha Halo in her cryopod, absolutely dead to the world until Chief and Cortana pick her up in their longsword at the start of First Strike. But of course, that's not going to happen here. She's just going to be floating in space forevermore. Also, very shortly after the end of Halo 1, Chief and Cortana rendezvous with Johnson and some of the other surviving ODSTs and other crew members from Alpha Halo, and they plan to capture one of the Covenant's nearby cruisers, the Ascendant Justice, and use it to return to Reach. Now, obviously, this rendezvous would never have happened, but I think that Johnson and the other survivors still likely would have tried to capture the Ascendant Justice by themselves because, I mean, to be honest, it was the only shot they had at getting back to human-controlled space and a way to safety. But without Cortana and Chief, their raid on the ship would have gone, well, horrifically, to put it lightly. I think they likely would have made it to the Ascendant Justice's bridge, but the elite that lies in wait for them on the bridge with his energy sword would have posed a major problem. Now, in First Strike, it takes the combined force of Chief Johnson and ODST Corporal Locklear to bring it down, and even still, Chief sustains injuries. Without Chief doing the heavy lifting, Johnson and Locklear, I'm afraid to say, are probably going to be toast, and in turn, so are the rest of the survivors of Alpha Halo. And that's just a bridge. I mean, to gain control of the entire ship, in First Strike, Cortana has to vent it and jettison all of the Covenant on board into space. But as we know, Cortana's dead, so even if the survivors did somehow manage to kill that elite on the bridge, they wouldn't have had a clue about how to interface with the Covenant tech and do the venting themselves, so there's no way in hell that the Ascendant Justice ever would have been captured by this team, which sends absolutely gigantic ripples down the timeline. One of the major ripples of not capturing the Ascendant Justice, and by extension, not capturing the exceedingly rare Covenant AI that was on board, means that Cortana will never uncover the Covenant's plans to invade Earth from said AI. 
Obviously, this means that in Halo 2, humanity would have been even less prepared for Earth's invasion than they already were. It also means that the Alpha Halo survivors never return to Reach to pick up its survivors, and those survivors on Reach include Red Team, which at the time contained Fred and Kelly of Chief's Blue Team, Vice Admiral Danforth Whitcomb, but most importantly, Dr. Horsey. Given the state of the galaxy at the time, and also that back on Earth, James Ackerson, one of Horsey's rivals, managed to dissuade the UNSC from sending a rescue team to Reach, we can presume that all of these crucial characters would have just remained stranded on Reach for the entire rest of the war. That means that Blue Team would have never fought on Earth, Horsey would have never gone to Onyx, etc, etc. But hands down, the worst butterfly effect of the Ascendant Justice not being captured is that Operation First Strike would have never happened. Now, Operation First Strike is almost like the unsung hero of the original Halo trilogy. Had Chief, Johnson, Locklear and co never carried it out, then, well, we'd all be speaking Covenant. Suffice to say that if First Strike never happened, then Halo 2 and Halo 3 stories would have gone drastically differently. Now, just a quick note, this video is kind of a pilot for future What If content on the channel, so if you're enjoying this video and you want to see more videos where I go down these kind of alternate timelines and look at these What If scenarios in Halo lore, then make sure you show some support down below in the comments, and also whilst you're at it, make sure you sub and also follow me on Twitter as well. Back to the timeline. After returning to Reach, reuniting with its survivors, and also fusing the Ascendant Justice with the UNSC Gettysburg Frigate, creating the rather aptly named Ascendant Gettysburg Hybrid Ship, Chief and the survivors turned their attention to something terrifying that Cortana had uncovered. The Unyielding Hierophant. A gigantic Covenant repair and refuel station that was currently arming up the Prophet of Truth's secret 500 ship strong Earth invasion fleet. Now, for reference, the fleet that Regret came to Earth with in Halo 2 was only 15 ships strong. This one's 500, so it's a big boy. Now, Operation First Strike was a mission that was devised by the Reach and Halo survivors to destroy the Hierophant, and with it, Truth's fleet. A mission that was actually overwhelmingly successful and ensured that Earth actually had a chance at holding off the Covenant invasion. However, with Chief and Cortana both dead and Johnson's raid on the Ascendant Justice either ending with the entire team being killed, or worse, taken as POWs, nobody would know about the Hierophant's existence, and furthermore, nobody would know about Truth's invasion fleet, and Operation First Strike would never happen. Suffice to say that this would make the invasion of Earth go rather differently, but we'll get to that in a minute. And you know, going back to the ripples created through the timeline by the team never capturing the Ascendant Justice, a ripple could even be detected in the Great Schism as well. Hear me out. So Truth's fleet at the Unyielding Hierophant was a secret fleet that he'd mustered that was entirely led by Brutes, and was meant to be the almost main takeover force, if you will, to kind of, what's the nicest way of putting this? Relieve the elites of their duties. Had this fleet been present at Earth, then, well, any elite versus Covenant civil war conflicts that occurred in and around Earth would have been even more in favour of the Brutes than they already were. And so, with all that said, we finally make it to the events of Halo 2. And this is where things really start to escalate. Of course, the absolute biggest change to Halo 2's story is that Master Guns never gets to tell Chief that his new shields are very efficient. And he never gets to bitch at Johnson either. <laughs> My ass! Poor guy. I wonder how he sleeps at night in this timeline knowing what could have been. On the real though, Regret's fleet would still come to Earth as normal, and the UNSC would still detect whispers at IO as the fleet passed by, which gives them a brief moment to prepare. But the initial invasion would go a lot worse for humanity. Firstly, Cortana wouldn't be manning the Kyra's Mat Gun anymore, so it'd be far, far less effective. Chief not being there means that the Covenant's raid on the station would be a lot more bloody. Tons more crew would be slaughtered, but worst of all, Nobody would deduce that the Covenant are raiding the orbital map stations to plant bombs and make holes for the fleet to reach Earth. And so, the Cairo would meet the same fate as the Athens and the Malta. No pickle bomb would be returned to its sender today. Instead, it'd be left to freely detonate on the Cairo, bringing the entire station down, but more importantly, 
it'd mean the death of an extremely high value individual on board, Lord Hood. You know, it was a really ballsy move, but despite being essentially the leader of the entirety of the UNSC, Hood stays on the Cairo for all of Halo 2's story. And so, in destroying the Cairo, the Covenant unknowingly just beheaded their enemy. The loss of Lord Hood would be a catastrophic loss for humanity, and would severely impair their tactical capabilities going forward, particularly when it comes to defending Earth. I think it's safe to assume that Earth's defense force in Halo 2 and Halo 3 was led overall by Lord Hood, but with him gone, that entire effort would have been even more disorganized than it already was. However, with all of that said, I actually do think that Regret's invasion of Earth would have gone about the same as it did in Halo 2. Despite the absence of high-value individuals like Chief, Cortana, Johnson, and Lord Hood, Earth was still heavily, heavily defended. I mean, it was all that humanity had left at this point, and so despite doing more damage than he does in Halo 2, I still think that Regret would have jumped to Delta Halo post-haste, and I also still think that the Enamaclad would have followed him there. Oh, just to make this timeline run a little bit smoother, we are going to assume that Miranda makes it off the Cairo before the station goes boom. Following Regret through the portal was always Miranda's idea, first and foremost, and I think with everything just gone to shit at Earth, she'd be even more convinced to throw the Hail Mary into the great slit space unknown and follow him into the portal. Now, before we go to Delta Halo, we first need to briefly discuss Truth's fleet that arrives at Earth shortly after Regret leaves, because, um, well, there's no easy way to put this. Truth is about to commit a massacre. <laughs> because Operation First Strike never happened, that means that Truth's 500 ship strong invasion force is perfectly intact, fueled up, and ready to continue what Regret started. Already softened up from Regret's initial invasion, this gigantic armada would have laid Earth's defenses to waste, and it would have had absolutely no issue whatsoever securing the excavation site. But more on that when we get to Halo 3. Obviously, the Enamaclad would have jumped to Delta Halo without Chief, without Cortana, and sadly without Jonathan there to lead the forces on the ground either, and because they weren't there, Regret very likely wouldn't have been assassinated in the Lake Temple, and he wouldn't have faced anywhere near as much resistance as he did locating the icon and later the control room. However, there's a missing element here that we haven't talked about yet, and my favorite part of Halo 2 in fact, the Arbiter and the Elite storyline. Now, I honestly think that Arbiter and the Elite storyline would have been mostly the same, at least up until now. Fel still would have become the Arbiter because Alpha Halo was still destroyed, and he and the Elite story up until now would be mostly unchanged. Truth planned the Great Schism far, far in advance, well before Halo 2, so the plans were already set in motion by the time Halo 2 began, and so even though Regret wasn't assassinated, which did, granted in Halo 2, act as a pretty major catalyst for the Brutes replacing the Elites, the Great Schism would have gone down mostly the same as it does in Halo 2. With that in mind, and despite their lack of resistance retrieving it, Tartarus still would have got the order to betray the Arbiter at the Index Retrieval Site, sending him plummeting down to the Gravemind, who of course now would have only had one prisoner. But luckily for the Gravemind, when he sends Chief and Arbiter to two different places to find the key and stop it from turning, the one that happens to be still alive in this timeline is also the one that he happens to send to the right place. Arbiter, of course. So Arbiter and the Elites push to the control room to stop Tartarus, and in this timeline, Regret as well from activating Delta Halo would be mostly the same as the events of Uprising and Great Journey in Halo 2. Except with one major difference. Of course, they would have had no backup from Johnson because poor guy's dead. So with that in mind, I don't think they would have been able to kill Tartarus. Johnson's elite beam rifle triple taps were the only reason that the Arbiter was actually ever able to deal damage to the Chieftain. Granted, he could have taken a beam rifle in himself, but Johnson was the one who had the idea first, and so without Johnson there on the sidelines, I think that boss fight would have been even more of a slaughter than it already was. It pains me to say this, but I think Tartarus would have absolutely battered the Arbiter because his invincibility would just be active at all times, which leaves Regret free to complete his sermons and activate Delta Halo. Presuming, of course, that he did bring some Reclaimer POW with him to, you know, press all the buttons because 
he can't do it himself. Poor guy. Now, I'm going to err on the side of caution a little bit here and say that given that this was anyone in the Covenant's first attempt at even trying to fire a Halo ring, Truth would probably move High Charity and its defense force away from the ring and away from its blast radius as well, just in case something goes wrong. That also makes the rest of this timeline a lot easier to talk about. So consider High Charity and all of its defense fleet safe from the ring's pulls, but everything else in orbit of Delta Halo? Absolute toast, and that includes Half Jaw, the Shadow of Intent, and a ton of dissenting elites, marking what would likely be the final blow to the rebelling elite forces. Now, it's here where we hit a little bit of a fork in the road for the timeline, because we need to deduce how the Halo fires. Does it fire a local pulse and only affect things in a 25,000 light year radius around it, or does it fire a regular pulse and in turn activate all the other Halos? Well, let's do some deduction. The Prophet of Regret was a foolhardy zealot, and you know what, that's putting it nicely. He was nowhere near as cunning or as devious as Truth, and so I think he would have basically panic fired Delta Halo with little regard for the actual type of firing that he was doing. And so, in that sense, I would imagine that the Halo fired only a local pulse, which means that only biologicals within 25,000 light years of Delta Halo would have been killed. The rest of the galaxy, including Earth, for now, would be fine. But I guess if you want to say that Regret would have fired a regular pulse, then, well, <laughs> that's the end of the timeline. Everything's dead. The Covenant have won. Congrats, I guess? But back to the actual timeline that we're covering in this video, where the Halo fires a local tactical pulse, not a big one, we hit yet another detail that we've not touched on yet. What happened to the flood outbreak on Delta Halo? Well, because High Charity would have been long gone from Delta Halo, I don't think the Grave Mind really would have had time to infect the Holy City. However, the Enamberclad still would have gone down to the surface to contest Delta Halo's index, which, in fact, in Halo 2, was the Flood's first infection target anyway. So, in this timeline, despite Delta Halo's firing, the Flood on the ring would have been unharmed, and so would have still been able to infect the Enamberclad. But more on that soon. With everything in the orbit of Delta Halo destroyed, many of the elite dissenters dead, and the Covenant Civil War mostly over, Regret and Tartarus, both happy, healthy, and still alive, would have left Delta Halo and linked up with Truth and Mercy on High Charity, boarded the key ship, and headed to the Ark via Earth. And thus begins this timeline's version of Halo 3. So, Truth, Mercy, Regret, Tartarus, and that general squad arrive at Earth in the Anodyne Spirit, activating the portal to the Ark. The gigantic brute-led fleet that was built in secrecy now has total control of Earth. Humanity, at this point, are essentially no more. They have no leader, no hyper-intelligent AI, no hyper-lethal vector, no badass, smooth-talking ground commander, and no alliance with the elites was ever made. This also means that the Covenant can quite safely bring High Charity to Earth to have it use the portal to the Ark as well, assuming, of course, that it's not too big for it. And so, the Covenant's still gigantic force jumped to the Ark, uncontested by any human or any elite. But I hear you asking, where the hell are the Flood? Well, although the Gravemind's ultimate goal is total galactic consumption, it knows what the Covenant's plans are, and it knows that those plans would totally and utterly wipe it out. So, I don't think that it'd waste time and manpower, or infected power, I guess, infecting Earth like it does in Halo 3. Its priority number one would be getting to the Ark to stop the Prophets from activating the Halos, so I could see it just jumping the Enamberclad and anything else that it managed to infect on Delta Halo straight to the Ark in pursuit, just like it does with High Charity in Halo 3. And that creates a rather interesting scenario. All because the Master Chief choked the Warthog jump on the Pillar of Autumn, the war on the Ark is now purely Covenant versus Flood. The real question, though, is how differently would this war have gone compared to the Covenant versus Human and Elites versus Flood War that we saw in Halo 3? Well, High Charity was never infected, which is where a significant portion of the Flood that fought on the Ark in Halo 3 came from, and High Charity was huge, so no matter how many hosts it infected on Delta Halo, and no matter how many pure forms it created, its numbers wouldn't even be a fraction of what we saw in Halo 3. And so, with that in mind, I honestly believe that the Flood in this timeline would fail to stop Truth. 
With the Grave Mines heavily reduced infected numbers and the Covenants vastly larger numbers, I don't see any outcome in which they win, quite honestly. I think the Prophets and their forces would be able to stave off the Parasite with relative ease, find the Cartographer, find the Citadel, and then activate the Helos with almost no resistance. Even in Halo 3, with the Covenant on the back foot, with the humans and the elites allied, and the entirety of High Charity's populace assimilated into the Flood, the Gravemind still had to strike a last minute alliance with Chief and the Arbiter to prevent the firing of the Halos. For obvious reasons, that alliance is no longer possible in this timeline, and with the Flood down, uh, well, an entire High Charity's worth of infected, it would not be able to punch through the Covenant's immensely strong defences and stop the Hierarchs from enacting the Great Journey. And so, the Halo Array would be fired from the Ark, with all three Hierarchs and Tartarus, Chieftain of the Brutes, present. And the entire galaxy would be wiped out, all because Chief choked the jump on the Pillar of Autumn. However, there's something of an epilogue that we've got to talk about that, unfortunately, is a rather interesting event that we never got to see in Halo 3 because we were successful. So, the Halos have all been fired, the galaxy has been sterilised of all life, and the only things left alive are the Covenant forces on the Ark. Only the Covenant forces present at the Ark remain, and they're rather confused. Why haven't they transcended to become gods? I can just imagine right after the Halos are fired and nothing happens, all the troops that are in the Citadel are kind of just like awkwardly looking around and they all simultaneously turn their gaze to truth and they're like, hang on, weren't we promised eternal godhood or something for doing this? You know, <laughs> there'd be this like really like awkward moment of realization when all the troops in the Citadel are like, hang on, was truth lying to us? Was this whole like, this whole great journey thing, was that, was that not true? You know, leave it in the comments what you think would happen next if, like, Tartarus was there and he realised that what the Arbiter said to him was true and the whole thing's a lie. And that was when he realised, once he'd pulled the trigger, he's like, hang on, hang on, this isn't right. Let me know in the comments what you think would have happened. But awkward post-Great Journey clarity aside, that is what I think would have happened to the Halo timeline had Master Chief died at the end of Halo 1. To say that things would have been different would be, uh... What's that old saying? Oh yes, quite the understatement. Obviously these what-if scenarios are highly subjective journeys into incredibly uncharted territory. I mean, the butterfly effect that even the smallest change can have is like frankly insane. So everyone's interpretations of these timelines and events are gonna be quite different. So leave your thoughts down below on my interpretation of this alternate timeline. And also if there's anything that you think would have gone differently, had Chief died at the end of Halo 1. And also, like I said earlier, this video is something of a pilot for what if content. So if you wanna see more content like this going down like alternate Halo timelines in the future, make sure you show your support down below with a like and sub and comments and all that good stuff. And so with that said, I'm gonna round this one out here. My friends, this is gonna be my last video before Christmas. So Merry Christmas. I hope you'll have a great time. Thank you for everything this year, honestly. Bottom of my heart, not gonna, not gonna go cringe or anything like that, but bottom of my heart, thank you all very much. I really, really do appreciate it. And so with that said, let's round this bad boy out here. I wanna give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there, as per usual. Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Merry Christmas and I'll catch you all, well, in a few days. See you later.